Suck, Chooms! So I am back with another video about everybody's favorite obsolete blood pressure medication that has been reappropriated as a hair loss treatment, oral minoxidil. <laughs> So yeah, I know I said I hate talking about this subject, but after my last video, I got really interested in some of the more recent research on the connection between oral minoxidil and heart problems. In my last video on low-dose oral minoxidil for treating hair loss, I talked about the flaws and biases in the existing review articles that present oral minoxidil in a favorable light, as well as bringing some attention to concerning new details that prove oral minoxidil's most serious side effects, like pericardial effusion, can happen even at dose as low as 0.25 milligrams daily. Pericardial effusion is a buildup of fluid around the heart. This fluid can interfere with the pumping of the heart, and when that happens, it's called a cardiac tamponade, and the fluid has to be drained urgently or you can die from it. We know that pericardial effusion was frequently reported when oral minoxidil was used as a blood pressure medication. For example, in this report from 1981, pericardial effusion was seen in 4.8% of people on oral minoxidil. We also know that pericardial effusion can happen with low-dose oral minoxidil because it was documented in a recent case report of a 40-year-old woman who developed it after taking just 0.25 milligrams of oral minoxidil for three weeks. We also know that the studies touting the safety of low-dose oral minoxidil for hair loss are based on retrospective analyses, which are biased towards including subjects who do well on oral minoxidil. For example, this study that some people brought up in the comments section of the last video I made on oral minoxidil, it seems to show a low incidence of side effects from low-dose oral minoxidil. However, the study only included people who were on oral minoxidil for at least three months. So this study would not even have included someone like the woman in the case report who developed a pericardial fusion after only three weeks of oral minoxidil usage. Unfortunately, to get a real idea of the incidence of serious side effects from low-dose oral minoxidil, you would have to do a prospective trial, and that has not been done and maybe is never going to ever be done on oral minoxidil. All of this is pretty scary stuff, especially considering how virtually everybody is buying oral minoxidil through gray market sources or getting prescriptions from dermatologists who don't have any training in internal medicine and don't do any cardiac monitoring whatsoever. But this all made me wonder, why is it that oral minoxidil is so damn dangerous to human beings? Well, fundamentally, minoxidil was developed as a blood pressure medicine, and all blood pressure medications can cause serious side effects. They all have the risk of dropping the blood pressure too much, which can cause people to pass out. But minoxidil is peculiar in two ways. Number one is that it causes hair growth growth, which is something that no other blood pressure medicine does, but we're lucky that it does, of course, since it turned out to be the best general hair growth stimulant available, which remains true even today. But at the same time, minoxidil also has the potentially deadly side effect of pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade. That's also something that no other blood pressure medication causes. So. Topical minoxidil was developed specifically to minimize the amount of minoxidil that gets absorbed into the bloodstream, and in the decades since topical minoxidil was made available, it looks like it has not been associated with any documented cases of pericardial effusion, but unfortunately, that is not the case with oral minoxidil, which is what I showed in my last video, as there is still a risk of pericardial effusion even with doses as low as 0.25 milligrams per day. So, no other blood pressure medicine causes hair growth, but no other blood pressure medicine causes this weird buildup of fluid around the heart either. So what is it that makes oral minoxidil so different, not to mention so dangerous compared to other blood pressure medications? All this really made me wonder if there's possibly some association between minoxidil's ability to grow hair and its propensity to cause fluid buildup around the heart. So I decided to do some balls deep research on this subject, and as it turns out, there is indeed a link between oral minoxidil's ability to grow hair and also cause fluid buildup around the the heart. The research which addresses this hypothesis comes from my favorite hair loss researcher of all time, the great Dr. Truib, also known as the Morden Solis Scientist Solarian of the hair loss research field. Just last year, Dr. Truib published a letter to a medical journal about the risk of pericardial effusion with low-dose oral minoxidil. In the letter, he commented on the same case report that I covered in my last video, namely the 40-year-old woman who developed pericardial effusion on just 0.25 milligrams of oral minoxidil. In this letter, Dr. Truib brings up yet another case from his own practice of a young woman who developed pericardial effusion, this time on 1.25 milligrams a day of oral minoxidil, which is still with 
within what is defined as low-dose oral minoxidil by a lot of dermatologists. Most studies of low-dose oral minoxidil have doses ranging anywhere from 0.25 milligrams daily to 5 milligrams daily, so we're not talking about the 10 to 40 milligrams of oral minoxidil used to treat high blood pressure. These are doses comparable to what most people are now using to treat their hair loss. This woman on just 1.25 milligrams of oral minoxidil per day developed shortness of breath, discomfort while breathing when lying down, chest pain, lightheadedness, and swelling in the legs. A cardiac ultrasound showed fluid buildup around the heart. This all developed within just a few weeks of starting low-dose oral minoxidil. So, this is yet another documented case of pericardial effusion from low-dose oral minoxidil, but what is really interesting about this letter from Dr. Trubb is that he proposes an extremely interesting, not to mention highly plausible theory as to what causes pericardial effusion from oral minoxidil. It turns out there is a rare genetic disease called Cantu syndrome. Now, Genetic diseases are due to defects in our genes. Even though most genetic defects are incurable, scientists have nevertheless still managed to learn a lot about what the different genes in our body do by studying people with genetic defects. A good example of this is the families who were first found in the Dominican Republic back in the 1970s who turned out to have a genetic defect in the gene that makes the 5-alpha reductase type 2 enzyme. Men who were found to have this defect did not develop hair loss, acne, or enlarged prostates, and this was the clue that showed that the trash hormone DHT was responsible for causing all of these horrible problems. This led to the development of 5-AR blockers like finasteride and dutasteride, which we all of course benefit from today. Day. So, contrary to popular belief, finasteride was not some prostate drug that was discovered to stop hair loss by accident. It was developed knowing full well it would treat hair loss. It was just approved to treat enlarged prostate first, as that was considered a more serious issue. Minoxidil's hair growth benefits, on the other hand, truly were discovered by accident because no one expected a blood pressure medicine would cause hair growth. So. Cantu syndrome is another disease caused by a genetic defect, and one of its features is that people with the syndrome have thick scalp hair that extends onto the forehead and generally increased body hair overall. Now, this syndrome has other abnormalities associated with it, but what is most interesting, though, is that 80% of cases have some heart abnormalities, and 25% of cases have pericardial effusions. So, there's some very clear similarities to minoxidil here in that we see increased hair growth as well as pericardial effusions in people who have Cantu syndrome. So that raises the question, is this just a coincidence? If not, then what is the genetic abnormality in Cantu syndrome, and is there any relationship to how minoxidil works? Well, the exact mechanism of how minoxidil works isn't fully known, but probably the most likely mechanism is the effect minoxidil has on a specific potassium channel in cell membranes. This channel is called an ATP activated channel, and minoxidil actually opens up this channel channel, which is a completely unique mechanism that no other blood pressure medications have. Opening this channel is thought to trigger the antigen growth phase of the hair growth cycle. However, these potassium channels are located not just in the hair follicles, but also in other organs, including the heart. So just to reiterate a point that often comes up, the mechanism of minoxidil has nothing to do with being a vasodilator and enhancing blood flow. All blood pressure medications enhance blood flow, but only minoxidil increases hair growth, and the reason for that is its unique mechanism of opening up the specific potassium ion channel in the hair follicle cells. So here's where things get really interesting, Chooms. You see, most cases of Cantu syndrome have now been linked to a mutation in a gene called ABCC9. What protein does this gene encode for, you may wonder? Well, it encodes for the exact ATP activated potassium channel that minoxidil opens up. Not only that, the abnormality in the channel caused by the mutation is a gain of function abnormality, which means it makes the channel more active. It is an activating mutation, so it actually does the same thing that minoxidil does. It opens up the channel. So minoxidil, when taking orally, effectively puts your body in the same state that it would be if you have Cantu syndrome. So it will regrow your hair while putting your cardiovascular system in serious jeopardy. So this similarity between Cantu syndrome and minoxidil was actually not first noted by Dr. Truem. In an article published in 2006, the connection between Cantu syndrome and minoxidil was first proposed, but Dr. Truub, unlike the average dermatologist prescribing oral minoxidil, is very well read and a well-published researcher who I should note is also very
very skeptical of the reality of post-finasteride syndrome, but that is another topic I've already published many videos about, and I'll link a few of them below if you're interested in learning more about that. So from this research, we know that opening up this specific ion channel can lead to hair growth, pericardial effusion, and other cardiac abnormalities. It doesn't matter if you open it up because of a genetic defect or through the use of a drug like minoxidil. The effects will be the same. So this research goes a long way towards explaining why minoxidil has both hair growing properties and a risk of cardiovascular complications. Also, with the addition of Dr. Truob's case report, there are now two documented cases of pericardial effusion with low dose oral minoxidil, and I imagine we're going to keep seeing these case reports piling up due to the sudden surge in popularity of oral minoxidil for hair loss, which was considered obscure up until a few years ago. So, some people might think these dangers may also apply to topical minoxidil. Fortunately, though, pericardial effusion with topical minoxidil usage has never been reported in a peer-reviewed journal, despite the hundreds of thousands or possibly even millions of people who have used topical minoxidil over the past few decades. It is an over-the-counter drug after all, so very likely it is completely safe, and whatever the case, it is clear that topical minoxidil is definitely the safer way to use minoxidil to treat hair loss. So, Dr. Truob closes all this with a note of warning that I'll read in full. Quote, Low-dose oral minoxidil has gained popularity as an off-label pharmacologic treatment for cosmetic conditions. However, as such, it should be prescribed with caution and monitored by physicians experienced and aware of the adverse effects of the drug and potential medical legal issues. Nevertheless, the drug is currently available online, although the practice of unattended consumer use of the drug is discouraged for obvious reasons of consumer safety." Unquote. I don't think I can add much to that, but next time someone wants to write a comment about how there are doctors who disagree with me, well, here is Dr. Truob, easily one of the most accomplished hair loss researchers in human history who shares my concerns about oral minoxidil. So if you'd rather listen to a pro-oral minoxidil doctor like Dr. Gary Linkov, who conveniently just so happens to sell and profit off of oral minoxidil, instead of Dr. Truob, who has no conflict of interest whatsoever, then that, of course, is your business, and I don't judge you for that. Like I have said, I am libertarian when it comes to the subject of drugs, but please, make sure you are aware of the risk and also make sure you have a doctor who has training in internal medicine or cardiology before embarking on what could be a perilous course of action. And with that, I think I'm going to lay off the oral minoxidil content for a bit, otherwise the salt from the oral minoxidil fanboys is going to raise my own blood pressure and give me a heart attack. So, we'll move on to other hair loss subjects soon, so I'll see you next time. God bless.